Namaskar. Namaskar students. Today we'll be moving on to lecture 15. Um, that is the theories of IR, our English series. And this will be on the research methodology or the methodology that international relations when you study a subject like international relations, what are the methodologies, research methodology that you should know? And here if you see to all the social sciences, see international relations, though a very interdisciplinary subject, belongs to the social sciences, that is political science. So we will be talking about debates that are in common if most of you are studying for any of the social science subjects, sociology, anthropology, political science, history, philosophy, and political science, uh, psychology, there are certain debates that are common. And it's important that we understand certain basic issues when you're trying to study these subjects. So the first issue that I want to flag for you here is the value-fact dichotomy. The fact-value dichotomy is a fundamental epistemological distinction described between, meaning it's an issue of epistemology and here it is statements of fact, meaning positive or descriptive statements based upon reason and physical observation and which are examined via the empirical method. What is a fact? Now let's say fact is that uh, uh, India's, what to say, in, uh, India's foreign policy has, what to say, recently had issues with China on the Galwan border. So India-China border, we have had skirmishes between each other. So this is a fact issue of fact. Statements of value are what? Normative or prescriptive statements, meaning that that incident gets interpreted in different ways. For example, you there may be people who are apologists for China, and we have a lot of them in India, who will say, no, 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 India only provoked China. China is not wrong. Like, for example, if we even, you know, uh, one Muslim is killed in India, they will say, oh, minorities are in danger in India. But the same thing, if there is a systematic campaign by the Chinese Communist Party of exterminating all minorities, Tibetans or Uyghurs, they won't open their mouth. So this is called interpretation. Where it is normative, it depends on which part of the ideology where you stand or prescriptive statements which encompass ethics and aesthetics and are studied via axiology. Second, whom would you associate? See, when you're talking about fact and value, what are we talking about? See, if you look at the entire political theory, international relations theory, it is a whole debate on what is and what ought to be. The second issue. This was first raised by David Hume. And uh, fact value means, for example, if you take uh, Plato's The Republic and his conception of an ideal society, it is what ought to be. Or the same with the social contractuals. If you say, they say what is today is the state of nature. What ought to be is, they say, uh, they give you uh, what to say a very different perspective so what is is a present situation when you're dissatisfied with the present situation you want to create an ideal society or a society that you think is better than what is there today so this barrier between fact and value implies it is impossible to derive ethical claims from fact factual arguments or defend the former using the latter the fact value distinction is closely related to and derived from the is ought problem in moral philosophy characterized by David Hume. David Hume was a philosopher, 1711 to 1776. The terms are often used interchangeably. 
though philosophical discourse concerning the is or problem does not usually encompass aesthetics so in a treatise on human nature in 1739 david hume discusses this problem of grounding normative statements in positive statements that is in deriving ought from is it is generally regarded that hume considered such derivations untenable and is ought problem is considered a principal question of moral philosophy so you have david hume who tries to theorize this problem this is david hume he is a scottish philosopher he lived between 1711 and 1776 now when we come to the social sciences how are we using this as a normative framework for our uh, understanding of the subject of international relations hume shared a political view point with early enlightenment philosophers such as thomas hobbes I told you the social contractualists who wrote Leviathan, 1588 to 1679, and John Locke, 1632 to 1704. Specifically, Hume, at least to some extent, argued that religious and national hostilities that divided European society were based on unfounded beliefs. In effect, Hume contended that such hostilities are not found in nature. but are a human creation depending on particular time and place and thus unworthy of mortal conflict prior to hume aristotelian philosophy maintained that all actions and causes were to be interpreted theologically this rendered all facts about human actions within the normative framework defined by cardinal virtues and capital wises fact in this sense was not valuable and back value distinction was an alien concept the decline of aristotelianism in the 16th century set the framework in which theories of knowledge could be revised see the whole debate that has been going on in social sciences is there is one group that tells you that you can have uh, what to say completely value free uh, objective research but many believe that this is not possible because human beings come in with a bias and unconsciously also that bias exists so the fact value distinction is closely related to the naturalistic fallacy a topic debated in ethical and moral philosophy g moore believed it essential to all ethical thinking however contemporary philosophers like philip of foot have called into question the validity of such assumptions others such as ruth anna putman argue that even the most scientific of all disciplines are affected by the values of those who research and practice the vocation meaning they say it's not only a problem of the social sciences it is also a problem in physical and Uh, biological sciences nevertheless the difference between the naturalistic fallacy and the fact value distinction is this derived from the manner in which modern social sciences use the fact value distinction and not the strict naturalistic fa fallacy to articulate new fields of study and create academic disciplines now fedrich nietzsche he wrote a book called thus spoke Zarathustra. In this book, the table of values hangs about all great people. Nietzsche points out that what is common among different peoples is the act of esteeming, of creating values, even if the values are different from one people to the next. Nietzsche asserts that what made people great was not the content of their beliefs, but the act of value. thus the values a community strives to articulate are not as important as the collective will to act on those values the willing is more essential than the intrinsic worth of the goal itself according to nietzsche the idea that one value system is more worthy than the next you see most of the religious wars are on this 
Although it may not be directly ascribed to Nietzsche, has become a common premise in modern school social science. Max Weber and Martin Heidegger absorbed it and made it their own. It shaped their philosophical endeavor as well as their political understanding. This is Nietzsche. He lived from 1844 to 1900. Now, what is epistemology? This is a word that all of us who do social science or IR research must understand. The is ought problem is closely related to the fact value distinction in epistemology. Though the terms are often used interchangeably, academic discourse concerning the latter may encompass aesthetics and social sciences in addition to ethics. The fact value distinction is a fundamental epistemological distinction described between statements of facts based upon reason and physical observation and which are examined via the empirical method. The theory of knowledge, especially with regards to methods, validity and scope. Epistemology is the investigation of you, what you distinguish between belief from opinion. From the Greek word episteme and logos, meaning the study of or understanding of knowledge. One of the five basic subdisciplines of academic philosophy, epistemology is the systematic and logical investigations of three fundamental questions. What are they? What is knowledge? Can we have knowledge? And how do we get knowledge? Now, if you see, you'll have to distinguish between two things. What is ontology versus epistemology? Ontology is concerned with what is true or real and the nature of reality. It asks questions like what is existence and what is the nature of existence? Epistemology is concerned with the nature of knowledge and different methods of gaining knowledge. Ask questions like what do you want and how do you know it? Now here I want to differentiate four important things that we have to understand when we are talking of research methodology. One, what is ontology? What is epistemology? What is methodology? And what are methods? Now, when we're talking of ontology, what's out there to know? How do we know what we know? How do we acquire the knowledge? And how do we proceed with that knowledge? Now, ontology comes from objectivism. Epistemology from positivism. Methodology is deductive. Methods are quantitative. Now, when an ontology is objectivism, existence of independent researchers. Positivism, epistemology, truth out there has to be discovered. Methodology, deductive, general to specific. Methods, interpretation of phenomena. The other you get is constructivism. Phenomena continually accompanied, accomplished by interpretivism, develop truth based on social interaction, inductive observations to theory, and qualitative empirical assessment. Now, when we're talking about the three these things, empiricism, what is empiricism? Empiricism is the role of experience, especially experience based on perceptual observations by the five senses. Rationalism, a knowledge acquired by intuition or is innate. All knowledge, constructivism is, all knowledge is constructed in as much as it is contingent on convention, human perception and social experience. So now based on this, when we relate this basic understanding that I have given you on research methodology to international relations and political science, 
it is important that these values came in through two important movements that took place within political science and international relations. We call it the behavioral revolution. See, the behavioral revolution of the 1950s and the early 1960s is a foundational moment in the history of political science and is widely considered to be a time in, where, in when the discipline shed its traditional roots by embracing its identity as a modern social science. The behavioral revolution of the 1950s and early 1960s is a foundational moment in the history of political science and is widely considered to be a time when the discipline shed its traditional thing. The publication of the 1908 of two significant books of politics marks the beginning of the behavioralistic approach in contemporary political science. The first book was a, a, published in England called entitled The Human Nature of Politics, written by Graham Wallace, who said the study of politics analyzes the institutions and avoid the analysis of man. Meaning don't in, uh, be, make it an analysis of human beings, but instead analyze institutions. His sentiments were reciprocated in the United States when you had Benti, who did it for different reasons. He wrote the process of government. It is a formal study of the more of the most external character of governing institutions. Both men criticized the formalism and legalism of traditional political theory. Their argument was that individuals run the state and in order to understand state actions, one needs to understand the behavior of these individuals that run the state their reasons, emotions, prejudices, institutions, and dispositions. So based on this, behavioralism as an approach to political science emerged in the 1930s in the United States as a result of dissatisfaction of the then existing approaches. Therefore, it represents a sharp break of previous political science approaches. This, because, this is because it emphasized our objective, quantified approach to explain and predict political behavior. Following the Second World War through until the 1960s, behaviorism was a source of controversy. It was the site of discussion between the traditionalists and the newly emerging approaches to political science. Now, what are the origins of this? The origins of behavioralism is often attributed to the work of the University of Chicago professor, Professor Charles Miriam, who emphasized the importance of examining political behavior of individuals and groups rather than only considering how they abide by legal and formal rules. But behavioralism came to make the study of politics more mathematical and scientific as it is the main requirement for the discipline to be deemed as a science. Behavioralism made a great impact as an approach to the study of politics, but wouldn't stop critics from criticizing. During the rise of in popularity in the 1960s and 70s, behaviorism challenged the realist and liberal approaches, which the behaviorists called traditionalism and other studies of political behavior that was not based on fact. But subsequently, much of the behavioralist approach has been engaged by the emergence of post-positivism in political uh, theory, particularly international relations. It is associated with the rise of behavioral science after natural sciences. So if we see very carefully, it is a movement that took in 50s and 60s. Charles Edward Miriam, 1874 to 1953, a professor at the University of Chicago. So the Chicago School, both in political science and international relations are extraordinarily important. David Easton. According to David Easton, behavioral research seeks to elevate the actual human being to the center of the attention. Its premise is that traditionalists have been focusing on institutions and virtually looking at them as entities apart from the components. 
The behavioral approach is an attempt to improve understanding of political science using systematic method with emphasis on empirical data so that political processes could be interpreted scientifically. Behavioralists adopt a science-oriented approach in studying political science and try to favor an interdisciplinary approach in analyzing and predicting political phenomena. The study stands in studying political situation can be justified by observing the ubiquitous nature of political science. This is David Easton. He's a Canadian born uh, uh, professor, uh, political scientist from 1947 to 1997, professor of political science at the University of Chicago. Born on 24 June 1917 at Toronto and passed away on the, in 19th July. What are the salient features? Tom? What are the characteristics or features of behavioralism? First, regularities. This be approach believes that there are certain regularities in political behavior which can be expressed in generalized theories in order to explain and predict phenomena in a particular situation, the particular behavior of individual may be more or less similar. Such regularities of behavior may help the researcher to analyze a political situation as well as to predict the future political phenomena. So study of such irregularities makes political science more scientific with some predictive values. Most of you know we have what is called these polls. Gallup polls before elections, electoral polls. So many of these studies came in after the, with the help of behavioral method. Second is verification. The behavioralists do not want to accept everything as granted. Therefore, they emphasize testing and verifying everything. According to them, what cannot be verified is not scientific. Third, techniques. The behavioralists put emphasis on the use of those methods, though or richer research tools and methods which generate valid, reliable, and comparative data. A researcher, according to them, must make use of sophisticated tools like sample surveys, mathematical models, simulation, etc. For quantification. This is simply the express or measure of the quantity of data. After the collection of data, the researcher should measure and not just measure, but also quantify those collected data. Next, values. This is the standards of behavior. The behavioralists put heavy emphasis on separation of facts and values. They believe that to do objective research, one has to be value free. This means that the researcher should not have any preconceived notion or a biased view. We'll later discuss whether this is possible. Systematization. This simply has to do with considering the importance of theory in research. But according to the behavioralists, research in political science must be systematic. Theory and research should go together. Pure science, another characteristic of behavioralism has been its aim to make political science a pure science. It believes that the study of political science should be verified by evidence. As a matter of fact, there are forces or factors that mitigate against the actualization of this aim, which include problem of measurement, bias, complexity, inability to experiment, self-fulfilling, and self-defeating prophecies. Integration. According to the behavioralist, political science should not be separated from other social science disciplines like history, sociology and economics, psychology, anthropology. This approach believes that political events are shaped by various other factors in the society and therefore it would be wrong to separate political science from other social science disciplines. Now, what are the four characteristics of the behavioral approach? It is a rejection 
of the political institutional method of basic conceptual units and substitution of the individual and group behavior. It is an emphasis on the unity of social sciences, hence an increased willingness to cross disciplinary lines. A great attention is given to precision, measurement and quantitative techniques. It aims at the development of systematic empirical theory. Now, who are the founding fathers? David B. Truman, Pandleton Herring, Peter H. Odegaard and V.O. Key. Another interesting thing is pointing out that those who wrote the most influential writings about behavioralism are Robert Dahl, David Easton and Hens. David Easton was known for his eight intellectual foundations of the behavioral approach. Now, what are the merits? It attempts to make political science scientific and brings it closer to the day uh, today of life of individual. The behavioral approach affords the opportunity to analyze and explain different political phenomena. It offers explanatory tools for studying the different political system of the world especially in development, developing countries based on the peculiar circumstances prevalent in each country. It facilitates comparative politics. This is done by comparing the different political institutions and systems in different countries and their handling of issues. Adherents to behavioralism believe that it is more dynamic approach than traditionalism because it relates thought on social order to changes in the political order. Behavioralists believe that the use of models, theories or hypotheses on behavior in the global community to explain the oligarchic content of human society where the privileged minority the world over control political fortunes of the majority. This approach helps in predicting future political events. Behavioralism has first talked about bringing human behavior into the arena of political science and thereby makes the study more relevant to the society. These are the merits. They say that it has been able to be more accurate. Now, what are the criticisms? First, ambiguous claims. This has been criticized for its dependence on small issues rather than tackling problems of a general perspective. The relay behavioralists usually apply themselves to particular circumstance and so the result of their exercise may not be applied generally to solve similar problems for its dependence on techniques and methods ignoring the subject matter. The advocates of this approach were wrong when they said that human beings behave in similar ways in similar circumstances. This is like saying that if you pinch me in a room and if I pinch everybody, everybody is going to react the same way. It is not true. Human beings are extraordinarily complex. If I'm in a good mood and you pinch me, I might smile. But you think that day I've been having a bad day and you pinch me, I might slap you back. So uh, this is the, the, as human beings are subject to changes, it's very difficult task to study human behavior and get a definite result. This has happened in most of the electoral studies. See, when you, most people don't want to say whom they want to vote for. Or let me say honestly also, let's say even if I've been very honest, one month before the election, I might have wanted to vote for A. But just a few hours before I go to the polling booth, I change my mind and vote for B. Because, because I'm a thinking individual, certain events could have changed the way I wanted to vote. Most political phenomena are unquantifiable. Therefore, it is always difficult to use scientific method to study political science or human behavior. Moreover, the researcher being a human is not always value neutral as believed by the uh, behavioralists. The contribution of the behaviorists are not entirely their original idea. For, uh, for instance, replacement of the concept of state, legislature, executive with such modern terms as system, input, are not particularly new innovations as changes in language and term of politics do not necessarily establish the and operation of government structures as a prerequisite for the study of the state. But ironically, nations and people uh, can exist and function in an orderly and manner 
uh, and operate through laws. So if you see very clearly, many people say the behavioral revolution only stays say the legislature into rule making, executive into rule, uh, uh, and then uh, the judiciary into rule adjudicating and rule executing. So these are just, they say that you, you are just changing and also emphasis of making the discipline more mathematical than descriptive should be approached with caution. It has been challenged by some other scholars based on the premise that the political man cannot be reduced to a mere mathematical formula or for that matter a chemical formula. Contribution, case study and analysis, observation and interviews, content analysis, other approaches, the structures of uh, structural functionalism and systems approach, use of statistical inputs. These are uh, and if you see within political science, there came David Easton himself spearheaded what is called the post behavioral revolution. The post behavioral revolution was what future oriented. It does not seek to return to some golden age of political research or conserve or even destroy a particular methodologically. It seeks rather to probe political science in a new direction. David Easton is the father of post behavioral. Behavioralism emphasized on fact based political theory. On the other hand, post-behavioralism stressed on value-based political theory with fact. Meaning they said you have a balance between the two. Post-behavioralists claim that despite the alleged value neutrality of the behavioralist approach, it was biased towards the status quo and social preservation rather than social change. Now what are the tenets of post-behavioralism? Substance must precede technique. Behavioral science conceals an ideology of empirical conservatism. The heart of behavioral inquiry is abstraction and analysis, and this serves to conceal the brutal realities of politics. Research about and constructive development of values are inextinguishable part of the study of politics. No neutrality is possible. Members of a discipline bear the responsibility of all learned intellectuals. The intellectual bears a special obligation to put his knowledge to work. And finally, what do they tell us? The primacy of the political. Post behavioralism challenged the idea that academic research had to be value neutral and argued that value should not be neglected. Post behaviorism claimed that behaviorism's bias towards observable and measurable phenomena meant that too much emphasis was being placed on easily studied trivial issues at the expense of more important topics. Research should be more relevant to society and intellectuals have a positive role to play in society. Hence, Ilahu described post behaviorism as a near hysterical response to political frustrations endangered by discounting and shocking events of the late 60s and the early 70s. So if you see clearly in methodology, I've given you briefly in a bird eyes view of what has been there in international relations. In the next lecture, we will deal with specifically international relations as an academic subject. Thank you.